Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for our Sudan update and to brief you about the uh, ongoing humanitarian crisis um, in Sudan and particularly Darfur. You all have seen a private UN report about the, the situation in Darfur in particular and then also looking into the situation in Sudan in general. It is, it is really catastrophic. It is really catastrophic in all, every sense. And since April 15th, uh, Sudan has been abandoned. It has been abandoned completely by the international aid agencies and the international organizations that are providing aid for millions of people who have been forced and displaced out of their homes over years. Uh, for the first time for Sudan to be this isolated. And it is really dangerous to have this kind of isolation since the beginning of the crisis. As you know, uh, on April 15th, uh, the fight broke between two generals, uh, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, uh, both of whom are, um, I think, two faces on the, of the same coin uh, because they have been working part and parcel until April 15 when they decided to disagree among themselves and, and and put the entire people of Sudan hostage to their own interest. And since then, the situation continued to escalate. The fighting broke in Khartoum quickly. The fight broke in Marawi, but quickly they put it off and then completely moved it into Darfur. And, and Khartoum has suffered the most. The areas that have suffered the most are Khartoum as a capital and Darfur region, the greater Darfur region, which is currently under the rabid support forces completely. We all know that the UN has declared that 25 million people are currently in urgent need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Unfortunately, there is no protection in place. There is no humanitarian aid in place. And this is a really conservative estimate. Why nobody has been able to go into Sudan and conduct an accurate or reliable assessment to understand exactly the number. But as we know from the knowing the Sudan and knowing the situation on the ground are more than 25 million, mostly 70% of the country's population are currently impacted by the ongoing war between the two generals. Many people are unaccounted for because of lack of communication. The government recent attempt to blockade communication and consistently both the government army and the rabid support forces have used the blockade of the communication means to increase the suffering of the Sudanese people, to increase the suffering, particularly in remote areas such as Darfur and South Kordofan, where they have already been through a long-standing crisis over the years. So cutting communication right now, it is equally dangerous as cutting food, medicine, and water. Why? Because if people can't communicate or can't make a call, simply your next door neighbor can die in silence before they can call for that help. Because it's not safe for people to go out seek emergency support, but also those who are wounded or sick people who are trapped under the debris of buildings that were bumped by the government air bombardment are unable to go out and seek support. And that is why many people have been killed, but their number have yet to be recorded because of the lack of access. Blocking access, not only isolating Sudan as a country, but also blocking the entire country out of communication means, out of phone services and internet services. And I tell you the current situation it can be characterized as the most and the worst humanitarian crisis of our lifetime. Why? Because no country in the world as isolated as Sudan of today. And at the same time, 
there is no access there is no any means of of, of production that is functioning right now the agricultural season is completely a failure because people were forced to flee people were terrified those who use irrigation farm they cannot have access to fuel or um money so that they can run their farm or buy what they need to farm but rather they have been terrified and they were forced to flee and were isolated in in group places, group shelters, whereby people living in schools, in public institutions, building, uh, in a number of households, like living in one household, kind of like 12, 20, 15 households are gathering and packed in one household. People are living in deplorable conditions that n uh, it is unprecedented. Nearly 8 million people have been displaced currently living in those conditions with no access to clean water, with no access to adequate food or health. Nearly 75% of the health facilities in Khartoum alone uh, went out of services. In Darfur, more than 80% of the health facilities went out of services. Attack on health workers like doctors, nurses, um, health agencies, volunteers have been documented. Why? It is not lack of just humanitarian aid, but also both parties have used, systematically used starvation as a means for, uh, and as a tool for killing because so that if people cannot die with bullets, they can die out of starvation because this is a silent killer. Starvation is a silent killer because you can. There is no, you can't touch starvation. You can't uh, document it. You can't take a picture of it because when they burn a village, people can take a picture of it. When they shoot people, people can take a picture of it and show. But when people are quietly starving in their homes, they cannot be seen. But you know that these people are dying in silence. And that is why it is really, really sad. We all as Sudanese diaspora, particularly those who are in the United States, in Europe, Australia, and other countries, you must use your voice and speak up to confront this current man, master, man that masterminded by these two generals. It seems that quite clear from the fighting that is going on right now is that this two generals are against the Sudanese people. They're not against one another because in all, in every sense of their fighting, they are imposing hardship on the Sudanese people from the capital throughout Darfur. And while in Khartoum, you see sometimes the, the, the army and the rabbit support forces are confronting one another, in Darfur is a completely different story. In Darfur, there is a systematic, with exception of al fashir whereby the Darfuri opposition and armed groups with a small military group that are there, they agreed and allied themselves that they will continue to defend the people who are living in al fashir because today al fashir in Darfur is housing the largest number of internet displaced population who fled from Niala, Kutum, Tawila, al Jinaina, Zalingi, and Eastern Darfur, Northern Darfur, so many places. They have fled to al fashir but al fashir is one of the cities that have no means of sustain. They usually depend, highly depend on food and other means of sustenance coming from those other small cities and rural area of the al fashir state or North Darfur state, and those rural areas are completely destroyed right now. These people are living in group shelters, such as schools, government institutions, and as I said, some people are packed in one small household, housing one another, but they have no access to adequate humanitarian aid. Today, the death and destruction in Darfur is unspeakable and unheard of. As recently, the MSF or Doctor Without Border have reported that Every two hours, a child dies in Darfur as a result of hunger and malnutrition. This is pretty true. 
because of the fact that last week in one day they documented 13 children died as a result of malnutrition and hunger let alone the adults who have yet to be documented who are dying as a result of hunger malnutrition diseases and lack to access to medicine or water and food in Darfur. The agencies, a few agencies that are able to get into Sudan, they only rely on their national staff to deliver limited humanitarian aid. There are emergency uh, lo local volunteer in emergency rooms that are allied themselves together to provide help to people. But these emergency uh, volunteers who are youth and women and civil society group are also become the number one target for both warring parties because they have been mobilizing youth, asking them to join either the government army or the rebel support forces. And then also, if they are found to move around, whether in Khartoum, in Darfur, or in Central Sudan, in Madani, they were accused either by both parties. Each one of them accused these young people that they are uh, they were one of those warring parties. Despite the fact that this warring, these young only volunteers at time. They, in most cases, they are displaced themselves. These are the people who fled in a case of Central Sudan in Medani. Most of the people that were arrested or targeted or killed, including in the in Sinar rural area, those who were killed are originally from Darfur. So it's quite clear that the rabbit support forces are systematically targeting the people of Darfur. You know why the situation, situation in Darfur is the most dangerous one as of now? We all know that Darfur has been going on through the longest standing crisis, one of the longest genocide in history is a genocide in Darfur that started in early 2002, 2003, that have never been addressed. It has never been addressed. Three million people who have been forced and driven out of their homes, they continue to live in the internally displaced camps. Today, Darfur house before the war erupted in April, on April 15th, Darfur used to house 122 internal displaced camps around suburbans of the cities and large uh, city council or villages. Those internal displaced camps, they were under attack again and again repeatedly during the current war in Sudan. So people have nowhere to go today in Darfur. A few people who are from West Darfur, nearly like a seven. 150,000 who cross border to Chad are mostly from West Darfur and from the side of North Darfur that are closer to Chad were able to flee because there is a short distance whereby people can go on foot or they can um, the horses, donkeys and, and other means of mostly people have to walk miles and miles to go there. But this is not the option for people from Central Darfur, from Far North Darfur, from Eastern Darfur. Most of these people are trapped. They have nowhere to go. In addition to that, then now the people who have been displaced by the current uh, war that started last year. Now this war has entered into, it is 10, 11 months. And we don't see any sign of war, that war is going to end anytime soon. So the people of Darfur suffering has been doubled and tripled because many people have been displaced more than 100 times again and again. These people have no inner energy now to run away. They just resorted to staying and either face their fate either by die they have only two options unfortunately they can either die by bullets or die by starvation trauma and lack of medical assistance this is really dangerous for the people of darfur i think and the situ the, the systemic attack as i said the difference between the attack in khartoum and the attack in Darfur is completely different, whereby in Darfur, the attack is very systematic. 
is directed toward specific ethnic groups who have been for a long time singled out to be killed back in 2003 who have been fallen victim to the the first genocide in the 21st centuries that was recorded in Darfur and these people remain under attack because they were unable to return home for the fact that their attackers have not been held accountable or be uh, not being uh, um, held accountable or apprehended Bashir Ahmad Harun Abdul Rahim Hussein and Ali Koshib were indicted by the International Criminal Court only Ali Koshib surrendered to the International Criminal Court which he faced trial and hopefully his case will be um, the verdict will be delivered sometime um, soon by the ICC unfortunately the three of them who have led and orchestrated and masterminded the most horrific attack against the people of Darfur. They are still um, at large running and, um, and, and invading justice because of the fact that they are not held accountable and because of the immunity. Today, Al-Burhan and Muhammad Degalu, they think they can continue to kill the people of Sudan. But as long as they can hold onto their weapon, they hold into the money and the power that they will continue to kill, rape, displace, and destroy the people and the Sudan and therefore, and that they will not be held accountable. Let me tell you, make no mistake, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity have no, there is no in such crime. These are serious international crimes, and no matter what, there is no immunity. But unfortunately today, the situation is urgent than what we think. It is really urgent. What needed right now, it is important that uh, the, 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 the international extended its jurisdiction and currently actively investigating this, the crisis in Darfur as a genocide that took place in al and in other places that have not been documented uh, precisely the way it was documented in West Darfur, but it is still a genocide. The pattern that repeated the 2003 uh, genocide attack patterns, but they are even worse because in 2003, the people who have been under attack were able to flee to the large cities such as Al Jinaina, the Linji, Al Dien, Al Fashir, Niala. Right now, those cities, with exception of Al Fashir, those cities are now under attack. And those camps where these internal displaced people have taken a refuge for protection and access to humanitarian aid is completely destroyed. Right now, there is no camps remain, with exception of a few camps that are remain in place. Many more camps have been wiped out, like in West Darfur. So the situation right now is calling for our attention. Those of you who are in the Sudanese diaspora, the supporters of Sudan and the supporters of Darfur, the friends of Darfur Women Action Group, it is really urgent that we speak up. The international community is clearly indifferent to the crisis in Sudan. But we can change this because we must speak up and call the attention of our leader that in the face of brutality and mass killing, they must not look the other way. In the face of genocide, must not look the other way. I have a great news, as many of you may have learned, that recently, two, three, two days ago, actually, a bipartisan Senate leaders within the U.S. Senate have endorsed as a re resolution that recognize the situation in Darfur as a genocide. And they emphasize precisely that the genocide in Darfur persisted and even repeated is because the genocide that taken place in 2003 was not fully addressed and was led to continue and that is why they now called for the American leadership for the Biden administration that they must take a leadership to bring a 
bilateral international community or international leaders to end and hold those perpetrated the crimes accountable. They also called for the U.S. to increase funding for Sudan with a special emphasis on Darfur, and su including supporting the locally led civil society, community-based organization, volunteer groups with provision of flexible funding that can aid this group to continue to support their people. But this is not a replacement for the international aid. They also called for an unhindered access to humanitarian aid. They called for an intervention that can protect civilians and open safe zones for humanitarian actors to operate in Darfur. And I think this is a really um, a great milestone in our fight to end the genocide in Darfur. But we have to seize this opportunity. We have to use it before it is too late. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you and appeal to you, now that the Senate has spoken and showed the people of Darfur and the people of Sudan that they are not alone, we must seize this opportunity to make our voice heard. We must call on the U.S. government and the international community that they must take an action that will effectively end the genocide in Darfur. In the first genocide, those negotiations, like the one that happened in Jeddah, does not bring solution because those negotiations does not concern the people of Sudan. Those negotiations concern, only concern the generals. It focuses on the generals. Did we see any serious step or tangible result from the Jeddah negotiation? No. There is also a large mobilization of a civilian group that they are seeking to come together to, 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 to a civil government. It is great. However, the way the civilians are heading it, they are not looking into addressing the urgency of the situation that currently we see. They do not take action that address the current situation with the sense of urgency it requires. They are meeting on WhatsApps, they are meeting on conference calls, they are talking, they are moving from different capitals, as if nothing happening in Sudan. They have to have that sense of urgency. They must have that sense of urgency because unless you address the urgency, keep people alive, you cannot create a government or civilian government? What are the tools? What are their leverage? When these two warring parties are let free to get weapons supplied from regional actors, such as United Arab Emirates, Iran, Libya, and so many other countries, Al-Burhan has his allies in the region and internationally, and Dagalo has their allies in the region and internationally. So, these civilians group are sitting with them, talking to them, but they have no leverage. They can exercise pressure because their approach is wrong. We must all agree that the situation in Sudan, especially a situation where genocide is involved, you cannot use a traditional conflict resolution tools to resolve a genocide. You know, genociders have never negotiated peace. Had Hitler given the chance to negotiate peace, there will not be Jew left and as of today. But luckily the international community, even though they failed to protect them immediately, later on they have taken an approach that was very prioritized accountability. Then they stipulated the genocide um, convention and put in place measures that never in the world in Germany, nobody will be killed because of who they are. So we must follow through the same. In the case of Rwanda, when the genocide in Rwanda took place, no one from those leaders who killed the people of Rwanda, who commit genocide against the people of Rwanda, were invited to the table. Their place is in the court. Their place is in, not in the negotiating venues. The same thing in Liberia. We have seen when Charles Taylor was exiled and then surrendered to the International Criminal Court, that did not just 
allowed the peace to take its course, it has granted people the opportunity to come together, negotiate peace, and put on terms of how they want to lead their life, how are they going to conduct their life moving forward and how they are going to create a safe environment for everyone to be recognized, their plight to be recognized, and then they can have um, justice in place, they have peace in place, giving people the right to go back to their land of origin, and then they, after that, they can ill their government. This has given the Liberian people an opportunity not only to bring peace, but to elect a first woman president. That would not have happened if the junters were given the chance to negotiate peace. Why Sudan is an exception? Because, you know what? You, the Sudanese people, have failed to understand the reality and the truth of our issues. The issue of Sudan is not a conflict, simply as people always put. It is not a civil war as some have been propagating. It is a systematic atrocities by the powerful against those who do not have power. And in most instances, like in Darfur, in the Nubam, and back in South Sudan even, people were killed because of who they are. They are targeted because of their skin color, because of the ethnicity that they represent because of being indigenous African in their land. And you know what? When the case is like this, when there is a genocide involved, the, it requires an approach. You can tell me, ask me what that means. When there is an atrocity, you, you all know that in 2002, the United Nations Security Council has adopted that responsibility to protect doctrine. It's not because of just politics. They realize that there are some instances that require an immediate and urgent intervention to halt it. When people are helpless and they are being killed with no reason, the international community is obligated. The international community is obligated. But let me tell you, sometimes you think you can sit and complain and then the international community will like you enough to pick the fight on your behalf. No, it requires dedicated advocacy, dedicated uh, mobilization to create global outrage, to create a global movement and global call for the international community, for the member state of the Security Council, for leaders like the U.S. government leaders, for all the uh, regional actors to hold to meet their obligation. You, we must speak to them. If we speak them to them in one voice, demanding that this approach does not work, the approach that they use for resolving the crisis in Sudan did not work. How many peace agreements has been signed over the years while people are sitting patiently in camp, waiting for just a piece of paper that can be credible and genuine to end their suffering? Never happened. Because what? The government in Khartoum led by al-Bashir, they know how to join, bring people apart, divide them to continue to conquer and offer them vacancies. They offer them jobs. They do not offer an approach that will address the underlying causes of the systemic marginalization, inequality, injustices that are perpetrated with total immunity. And that is where the problem lies. And right now, the Sudanese leaders are repeating it. Guess what? In 2019, the people of Sudan have come together and unified their voice for once. They said, rejected the military ruling and rejected al-Bashir regime, and they toppled al-Bashir. Guess the interim government have given the opportunity to the military to come back again. And what Muhammad Dagalu and Al-Burhan use right now, it is very, very similar to the app that is used for the last 30 some years by the regime of Al-Bashir. For, for fact, the al has been ousted, but his regime has never gone away. His totalitarian regime is very present, and that is why 
represented by the two actors currently besieging and putting the people of Sudan hostage and perpetrating this and destruction because they are rebranded their face, rebranding their face, presenting themselves, coming with different agenda, but it's the same strategy. Kill them all, wipe them out, force them to flee. What does mean if you understand when people are dying, they, in, they are in humanitarian aid. The government went into Qatar and brought um, a passport machine so that they can create passports for everyone who wants to leave the Sudan. Why would a government, in the right sense, if they are genuine, encouraging people to leave the country while they have the ability to end the war and allow people to peacefully live in their country. Currently, Sudanese are suffering in the different neighboring countries, lacking food, shelter, and access to decent life. Why? Why on earth? Did you ever ask yourself? And you're still thinking, sitting patiently waiting, thinking these two generals will be negotiating here and there and bring peace? No, they are not. They are making peace. They are wired to sink war and destruction because they survive in chaos and destruction. Their hands are full of so many and so much blood of the Sudanese people. They cannot bring peace. You have to think for yourself. That is why we advocate that the international community, the U.S., the African Union, must take an atrocity prevention approach, which is to start as I start. I asked earlier, start by protecting civilians, immediate and robust intervention that will provide civilian protection for those vulnerable and open and unhindered humanitarian access to enable the delivery of humanitarian aid, but also to protect and allow the humanitarian actors to go in without fearing losing their life. And then allow the fact finding investigation that was just commenced by the internet the, the, by the UN human rights council to investigate crimes allow ordinary citizens like me and you to document atrocities and be able to document those so that they can seek justice then accountability will follow after the accountability these three steps must be prerequisite to any peace effort after protecting civilians, enabling unhindered humanitarian access and documentation of the atrocities, then holding those perpetrators the most serious um, atrocities accountable, this will create an enabling environment for peace, whereby those who are oppressed, forced to flee, let to suffer in silence can be able to have a voice over those venues put on their agenda for change and for for resolution of the crisis in sudan and particularly the people of darfur today if there is any negotiation i don't think anyone from darfur will be able to participate looking at the people in the diaspora of course we are from sudan those who are dying are our people but we do not represent them this is an oversimplification of nominating ourselves and thinking that we're, why would we allow, there is, this is not the time when people will be sitting suffering there and you are taking advantage of them and going negotiating in those venues and bringing and impose peace. Peace will not happen that way. And think when we take this approach, then allow the opportunity for people to negotiate peace within their own term that they want. Also putting in place a measure that will recognize the plight, especially recognizing the genocide in Darfur, providing psychological and moral recognition, providing access to support for people and enable them to return to their rightful land. Those people who were pushed out of Al Jinaina into Chad, they must come back to Al Jinaina, to Dar and Doka, to live where their ancestors lived, where they were born and raised. There is no one under the Declaration of International Human Rights, no one can strip anyone their right to live in peace or to live in their land 
or to be who they are and that should be very step like very quite clearly stipulated in every solution that can be made to the current crisis taking place in Darfur with especially in in Darfur in Sudan with special emphasis on the genocide in Darfur enabling people and giving them the right to return to the rightful land to restore their stolen belongings and to restore their dignity whereby they can sit in a court of justice and tell their stories of suffering that is when a sustainable solution can happen some people can say oh this is difficult the international community doesn't care much about sudan who is the international community we are all the international community we the individuals are the inter members of the inter community we have to use our voice you have to mobilize support the american public are the international community not only their government they can tell their government what they want to see and with election now upon us you must choose elected official that respond and intervene when there is a genocide because genocide is an inevitable and it can happen like the attack in ukraine nobody ever said that in the next door to europe that this kind of atrocities will take place and that is why it is important for the united states to end the genocide in sudan because if you cannot end it in sudan you cannot end it in ukraine or you cannot end it in israel or palestine so it is important and if you cannot end it to establish precedence that no one above the law in sudan you cannot hold putin accountable and we must say clearly that to the international community including the united states government if we can mobilize those of us who are in the US, in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East, use our voice, talk to our allies, get them out and get them fair and speak and hold these leaders accountable, we can end this. But if we kept silence, what will happen? The Sudanese people will die in silence. The people and the victims of the Darfur genocide will die in silence. And those perpetrated genocide will never be able to help accountable. But we should never let that happen because we are capable of doing that. We are capable. It takes only one voice. It takes only one action. It takes only one step. Do not strip your power and think that those who have the power are those who are nominated or officially given titles. No, you do have more power than what you think. Your voice is your power use your voice speak up that in the 21st century this is 2024 we must not condone complicit or ignore a genocide or allow it to happen without so today i am appalled by the level of suffering that is ongoing right now across the sudan particularly in the capital khartoum many people are unable to flee in south kordofan recently attack has been directed to the people of South Kordofan who like the people of Darfur have suffered for so long. Many of them who fled and living in caves, they have not yet to return home until this war started. The same thing for the people of Darfur. Can you imagine that a person who stripped away from their belonging, from their land, from everything they have, and they were forced to live in and a makeshift camp in a desert that lack no means of sustenance can live in camps for 20 years and you expect them to survive another genocidal attack this is insane this is cruel and it is unacceptable and we must not allow this to happen and to continue to happen and it is up to us please speak up for the people of Darfur. Please speak up for the people of Sudan. And I would like to tell you that the African Union is meeting this week in Addis. We have a letter that is going to African Union to encourage them to take the lead, to intervene to protect civilians and to open humanitarian corridor. We are also urging the United States to support and work hand in hand with the African Union as a regional organization, even though the complexity 
across the continent, the African Union is in a better place to help bring peace to Sudan because I don't see Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates or any of these Middle Eastern countries that have the interest of the people of Sudan at heart, particularly those of us from Darfur, the people of Darfur who have been sent out to be killed by the Arab militia because of who they are, because of being indigenous African in their land. Truth be told, they are funding and financing this war and this genocidal machine. The person or the country that is masterminding a genocide, funding the genocidal machine, will never bring solution. You must protest and say no, that our plight will not be negotiated in such country. Both Saudi Arabia and United Emirates they don't deserve to be given a leadership position or our government in the United States should never walk behind them because this government, they don't respect human rights. They don't care if the person commit war crimes. They don't care if the person commit any violation. They don't care if they oppress women. They don't care if you call someone with a dark skin like myself a slave. It is still Racism is very present and the worst racism is the Arab racism in the Middle East. We do not, and they have no law that can protect those who have been oppressed or abused by their thinking or their action. So I cannot expect a country like that to bring solution to me. The country that want to exterminate you, eliminate you so that they can take advantage of your resources, the gold, the oil, the land, the water and everything. No. For this reason, we have to speak up. Many people are propagating that, oh, the international community is not, doesn't care about Sudan. The international, it is not to the international or individual leaders. It is up to us to make our voice heard. It is up to us to speak to them and compel them to act change their policies because it's only us who can speak up, educate them and exercise pressure over them to create an informed policy decision that will use an atrocity prevention approach. And I wish to remind you again, let us use this Senate resolution recognizing the situation in Darfur as a genocide. If we can pursue justice for the genocide in Darfur, we will be able to pursue justice for violation that happened in Sudan. And let me tell you, we must never compromise in pursuing accountability for attack against women in Sudan, in the current war, and is in the long-standing crisis in Darfur. The perpetrators have used rape and sexual violence, including all forms of sexual violence, including sexual slavery against women and girls. For what reason? No woman ever carried gun or fought or ignited war in Sudan or elsewhere in the world. Why would they attack women? And this is a crime that women is never let to go unpunished or without accountability. And empowering women and empowering the victim and survivors to speak for themselves is must be our utmost priority. Not only speak for themselves, but we must create a space to create a space everywhere at the UN within the U.S. government uh, institutions, within the African Union institution, we must allow the survivors and the victims, those who impacted the most, to have a voice because these people are not simply survivors or victims. These are people like me and you who ch someone else choose to victimize them, choose to silence their voice. They are expert in their issues. They, they know their plight. They know how to resolve it and they know what to do to resolve it and they are capable of working hand in hand with the regional and international and local and national actor to resolve but they also must be part of those who will be setting new institution in sudan that we must not allow nobody on earth to commit a genocide um, i will stop here thank you so so much for taking the time to listen to our presentation. I will continue to bring these updates to you. Do not forget that in Darfur, every two hours a child dies as a result of hunger. 
every day we hear horrible and horrified news about elderly who are dying of hunger. Every day we are hearing news about people who simply they need surgery. They could not reach the hospital and they die as a result of their illness. These are daily stories and, and lives of our people in Sudan and in Darfur in particular. We must not forget the degradation of our people in al -Jinayna. We must not forget the large displacement and the mass exodus of those people who were forced to flee their land. And they were told that now al is free from Abid. They liberated it and that is no longer be called. We must all commit ourselves to work together to make al Jinaina Darandoka today, tomorrow, and forever. And that only justice can put everyone in place. And um, feel free to send us your questions. If you have any questions, if there is any topic that you want us to address in the future, please do so. And continue to tap uh, into our social media, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and let us know how we can work together to empower you so that you can speak for your people and our people, not only in Sudan, but genocide should never be allowed to continue anywhere in the world as we do speak for all the oppressed in Darfur, in Sudan and elsewhere. We must continue to do that. Thank you so much.